So our next speaker and a fir uh, last speaker before the break is Stefano Cassano. And he is a data scientist uh, specializing in big data analytics. And just quick, uh, quickly going through his CV, which you can find on LinkedIn, uh, he started his uh, um, love to data science as uh, uh, students of physics and after this nuclear physics at the University of Torino. He decided to do a PhD uh, also in physics in big data and uh, even went to CERN for a year to analyze uh, some big data and uh, as I understand it's really big data in, in their case. And after this, he uh, spent some time in Imperial College uh, London when he was already supervising PhDs and, and younger colleagues, also on collaborating, also still collaborating with CERN. And after this, it was not enough to uh, for him. He decided to move to private sector and to big data analytics. And uh, he was working for one year in uh, Nexion Data Science, implementing big data algorithms uh, to provide online notifications for the customers. And now he's doing uh, some automated big data predictive analytics with machine learning and open data embedded access in a predictive layer. And uh, one thing which you're not going to find in his CV is whenever I'm sending his anyone email, uh, he's the first one who responds. Like when I'm asking for abstract or title, it's from Stefano, the first one. <laughs> Thanks, Pavel, <coughs> for the nice introduction. Can you hear me good? Yes, it's okay. Um, thanks. Okay, so uh, Pavel mentioned many times big data during uh, while he was presenting me. Uh, it's actually not really very big data what we do in a predictive layer, but I hope it's still, uh, still very, uh, very interesting. Um, so I'll be talking about the time series, time series forecasting, and uh, I will bring example from the energy sector. Um, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, so first of all, I would like to give you an introduction, which is a bit didactic to the time series, because even if some things uh, may be obvious for some of you, I guess it's, uh, it's a good uh, to, to, to have some, some points really uh, define uh, uh, um, uh, formally. Uh, then I will be talking about uh, automated machine learning. Uh, so what does that mean? What are the techniques uh, that, are, that are involved? Um, and then I will, I will show an example um, coming from, uh, from our company, one of uh, our clients, uh, namely energy demand uh, forecast in, uh, in, in France. Uh, OK, so this is, uh, I guess, an introduction on, on me. but. Uh, Pavel did already a great job uh, in, in presenting me. Um, what is Predictive Layer? So my company, uh, it's uh, founded in, uh, um, in Switzerland in 2015, and is currently based in Roll. Um, so we are a predictive analytics company, and uh, we provide automated machine learning uh, a solution in several different domains. Uh, so energy is just really one of them. Um, we have finance, we have transport, we have retail, supply chain, dynamic pricing, and more. So if you are interested in, uh, in what we're doing, just come to me, come to us, because there are also colleagues of mine around during the apero, and uh, you will know more about that. Um, what I li like about, uh, about us is that uh, we have a unique business model that really focuses on the value that forecast uh, deliver to the client. We don't just sell software solution. We sell value with our forecast. And uh, um, we, we share this value with the customer. OK, let me start with this uh, gentle introduction to time series. So what is a time series? Um, usually when I don't know something, uh, first thing I look it up on Wikipedia. And that says that a time series is a series of data points indexed in time order. So that means that it's a data set with a fixed order. Uh, but if I play the devil advocate, uh, so every observation in every data set in the world is collected at a specific time. So do we always need to index on the time? Of course not. And my claim is that depends on the application rather than the data. And uh, one easy way to, uh, to understand whether you are doing time series or not is ask yourself, ask yourself am I going to use my model to predict the future using the past information? Or uh, am I actually trying to describe something that I have, I have already in my hands right now? So these are two different uh, approaches. 
So um, time series versus static um, traditional machine learning, if you want. Uh, well, the time order um, that is induced in the data set puts a lot of constraints in the, the workflow of a, of, a, of a machine learning um, task, uh, from data collection to the deployment of the model. Um, and pretty much all of that is related to the so-called look-ahead bias. Okay? Uh, that means that when we predict a time t, that prediction should not be influenced in any possible way by an observation which is collected after time t. And th this may sound really obvious to all of you. Um, it's obvious because if you think about, I want to forecast the f uh, tomorrow, today, of course, I don't have any information from tomorrow. So I'm not going to use information from tomorrow. But when you train your model, that is uh, not so obvious in many, in many different uh, um, aspects. Uh, some of them are collected here in these slides. Um, so let me go directly through uh, the data cleaning, for instance, to give an example. Um, when you impute missing values in a time series, um, well, I guess uh, many of you uh, would like to use the mean, the average of a certain variable over the sample to, 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 um, to fill the, the missing values. And that's clearly something that you don't want to do with a time series. Uh, for at least two reasons, maybe I will go, I should have put this, uh, this plot maybe to explain, but if you have a time series like that, and you have, I can't, okay, so if you have a missing data here, and you fill with the mean of this uh, time series, you are introducing an outlier, you will have a jump at that point, so it's clearly something that you don't want to do, but also, if you do that, you're using, again, the information from the future to feed something in the, in the past. So you'd rather use like seasonality, for instance, to feed the missing values. Uh, say you take, uh, you take some values that are one week before, one day before, uh, and so on. Um, then also in the, during the data collection, you, there, there are a certain number of things you, you want to keep in mind. So for instance, your, your time series uh, will likely have a seasonality, which is, is typically years. And uh, you want to make sure to collect enough to cover some of the seasonalities. Otherwise, you will not catch these, these, these seasonal patterns. And also, you don't want holes in your, in your data set in a, in a time direction. And also, you want recent data. So if I want to forecast tomorrow, I want data until yesterday, until today. I don't want to use 2015 to, to, to forecast 2018 because the data will not be relevant. Another important uh, aspect of time series is the model validation. So I guess many of you are um, familiar with the cross-validation technique. Um, that's clearly forbidden in a time series because uh, you will uh, end up using the future again to, um, uh, to infer the past. So what are the alternatives to that? Well, there are some kind of time series cross-validation where you have this, this rolling uh, train uh, data set with, which is eating the test set while you're on. Or just, just simpler, you play simpler, you just have an old data set, which is this one, and you use everything before then to train your model. OK, so um, I hope you bear with me uh, with this introduction. Um, now let's, let's go to, to some more technical details about uh, what, uh, what is automated machine learning. It's, it's really something that sounds a bit fancy, right? Uh, but um, it's actually um, uh, very, very simple and just has to do with automatize uh, some aspects of the workflow that you know you're going to repeat many times because you're always dealing with time series. One of these, of course, is the feature generation. So the time order is something that create some, some troubles while treating your data set, but also gives you some, some, some standard candles, like, uh, like some, some, some nice feature engineering techniques. Uh, so when you want to catch seasonalities, you want to, to take some, some, some values that are uh, referenced to, to, to past, uh, past, uh, um, uh, past periods, like uh, one week ago, like one day ago, one month ago, and so on. You want to look at distrib uh, the distribution of your signal over a, a, a past period. Um, you want to catch the trend by, by doing differences in ratio with the past values. 
and so on, and other, other nice techniques that you can, you can use. Um, at predictive layer, what we, uh, what we do, which is uh, very interesting in my opinion, is that we completely automatize this, uh, this type of, um, of uh, feature, uh, feature generation. Uh, and we apply this transformation to all the time series that we, we take as input uh, to, our, to our problem. Um, and let me tell you that this may lead to, to, to a very large number of features, uh, easily tens of thousands of features, when you have several exogenous data that you're using. So how to handle so many features? Well, of course you can't, so you have to do some feature selection. Um, and what we, what we typically do is to use evolutionary algorithms for that. These are well-known algorithms uh, with a wide range of applications um, and uh, allows, allows us to, to uh, converge to a strong solution, so to select a subset of, a, of this very large ensemble of features in a reasonable uh, amount of time. Okay, so a detailed explanation of what a gene genetic algorithm is is really outside this, the scope of this uh, presentation. But I just want to, to give you an idea. So you start with a random population. What is a population in terms of a uh, feature set? You can think, think of it about um, a, a, a bit vector. So you have a, a population of big vector, which encode the, the information of whether a feature is included or not. And you perform some, uh, some uh, um, transformation that allows you to, to create some diversity in your, in your sample. And namely, those are crossover, which are I think best described by this, this picture. Um, you can also do mutation. Uh, so just flip one, one bit, an average one bit uh, randomly in your, in, your, in your feature set. And you increase your population, creating the diversity. Uh, you evaluate every uh, individual in your, in your population. And at this point, you do some selection on the individuals with the principle that you want to keep the, the, the fittest individual. But you don't just want to keep the fittest of the fittest, right? Because uh, that will, uh, will, um, uh, will lead you to, to, to local minima and, uh, and this kind of problem. So you, you still want to give a chance to the weaker individuals to survive. And uh, there are several ways you can do that. You tournament selection and all these all this kind of uh, um, techniques. And uh, I, I recommend you go through the literature um, that you can easily find by, by Googling. And, very, very interesting topic. Um, as far as the modeling is concerned, um, so once you have your, your selected feature set, um, you, want to, you want to train your classifiers. And we, we do hyperparameter tuning on them. Uh, we typically use uh, uh, open source libraries, so nothing, nothing really fancy. I think every one of us has already seen these, uh, these guys there. Um, in particular, we, uh, a predictive layer, we really like a tree-based method. And this is a uh, because they, they really trivially provide a feature importance indication, um, which is a bit trickier with, uh, with the neural networks, as, as, as you know. Um, and this is uh, important also in a, in a business perspective, because when your, your client is asking you how your model is working to, to provide the forecast, uh, then you have some, some handle to, you know, to, to, to tell him uh, what are the, uh, the most important indicators. Uh, then we do some. We have some some techniques to do uh, automatic ensembling uh, exploration, uh, and we usually do it uh, by by testing a very wide uh, set of uh, of ensembles to to improve the accuracy because you know adding diversity again is something that is important. Um, okay, now let me go to. Um, I try to describe you a bit the the workflow. Uh, let me go through a, a concrete example, uh, which is. Uh, the energy demand forecast in France. OK, so this slide is just to tell you that why it's so cool to do machine learning uh, uh, in, uh, in the energy sector, because there, things are evolving quite quickly uh, due to new technology, uh, deregulation of markets, and so on. Um, and in particular, when you go to, to energy demand supply, you will see that having accurate forecast allows uh, to have uh, optimization of energy trading network efficiency and preventive maintenance. And in particular, the last two are very important for this, uh, uh, for this use case that I'm going to present. So RTE is the, is the electricity transmission system operator, or, in, uh, um, or TSO, uh, of France. 
and uh, which is responsible for the operation of the high voltage grid in France. Um, and the task here is to forecast the energy consumption in France one day in advance, or what we used to, uh, to, say, to call is day ahead forecast, day plus one forecast sometimes. The granularity is 30 minutes. Um, so we will, we, we will have a 48 slots per day to forecast. Um, and we um, run our model at midnight. So we will uh, forecast from 24 to 48 hours in advance. Okay. And uh, I try to summarize in this uh, in the scheme uh, uh, what I what I said before about the uh, the workflow of the automated machine learning. Uh, so we have inputs which are time series, and of course these uh, these are indicators that we know with our domain knowledge, if you want, that are uh, important for the problem. Of course, you can imagine that weather. Uh, plays a role in the in the consumption of energy, um, but also uh, calendar type of features uh, for the seasonalities, holidays, of course, and of course the the autocorrelation of the target itself. We apply this feature generation uh, automatic procedure. We end up having several uh, hundreds, uh, in this case, of, uh, of of features generated. And we really don't know, like from the start, we really don't know what is the particular feature that performs better in this, in this model. So we, we let this, uh, this genetic optimization run and, uh, and find it for us. Uh, and this is typically the most, uh, the most expensive uh, part of the, of the, of the world uh, uh, workflow. Um, once we have that, we have a, a modeling and sampling, as I described before, testing several combinations of different model classifiers create diversity, we ended up having a set of, of models. Um, and uh, at this point, we enter a loop where we do the forecast, then we get fresh data, then we do the forecast again, then we get fresh data, and so on, every day, until something breaks, because sometimes it happens. Not so often, <laughs> fortunately. Um, so this is a bit how it works uh, with, uh, with the automatic uh, time series uh, forecasting in, uh, in predictive layer. So uh, as a result, which allowed me also to, to show our very nice dashboard and website, um, this is an example where uh, you're forecasting uh, Tuesday, uh, 2nd of October. You have this kind of shape. And you see that, uh, of course, the, the forecasts are following the shape quite, uh, quite well. And you see how the shape is different, for instance, uh, in, uh, in Sunday, on Sunday, due to, you can imagine, different uh, habits of the people uh, traveling maybe during the weekend. So it's, it's, very, it's crucial here to really encode the information from the calendar, uh, the holidays, and so on. So the results are, uh, are just depicted uh, very briefly here. Uh, so we were able to, in this case, to um, to do better than the in-house forecast uh, of, uh, of, the, of the TSO um, by, I would say, a, a quite a, a significant margin. Um, and this leads me to, to my conclusion. Um, so I try to give an introduction on what is a time series, how you treat uh, day after day uh, a time series, um, and what are the constraints that are imposed by this, uh, this, this time series approach. Um, at predict predictive layer, we, uh, we have an automated machine learning uh, tool um, which provides solution to tackle time series problem. And this is very nice because it allows us to really be able to, uh, to, 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 to tackle diverse approach with basically the same tool and some domain knowledge. So very, very interesting uh, um, uh, model. And I presented the, the use case of uh, energy demand uh, forecast in France for, for RTE. Um, and uh, here, the accuracy of the forecast is crucial to, to avoid large imbalance in the, in the, in the grid. Uh, and in this case, we were uh, really good in, uh, in, uh, in lowering the, the average error um, um, to, uh, to improve the forecast uh, that were, were already present uh, in-house. And that's it. And I'm very happy to, to reply to your questions.
I, um, I didn't quite get the part where you don't want to use uh, future information. Like some of your uh, inputs, so you can, we can predict them with a high uh, uh, accuracy, like uh, national analysis uh, in the next 48 hours. We have a good prediction on the future uh, information. You but said all days, sorry? National holiday for the next two days, it's yeah. a known future. Yeah, but it's not, some, it's not an observation that you collect in the no, future. No, but the okay? weather so also, you can forecast mm. with relatively good No, no, we do, we do okay. use forecasting. Yeah. So you use fu predicted future information. But let me just um, introduce my point. In computer vision, in when you want to uh, compress a video, uh, we can use what we call uh, variable autoencoder model. So you have a, the machine learned encoder model, a machine learned decoder. Mm -hmm. And it's used if you take the, the compressed version, the compressed version, uh, the, this embed, embedding vectors, mm -hmm. it's actually, if you, if, you, if you look at the latent space of this vector, it allows you to navigate uh, along future prediction, possible future, uh, of this uh, of this uh, encoding, so uh, typical approach would be used to predict the potential future uh, on, on simpler data, on more uh, uh, single so dimension data. So you're you're suggesting to use uh, autoencoders to to so tackle time series uh, yeah, for. I can point you to some interesting. I'm very I'm always very interested to to know about new techniques. Uh, in, uh, well, in particular, we don't use uh, autoencoders. Uh, uh, so I, uh, I see a lot of questions, but uh, we're going to allow for one, so it's going to be a break, uh, water, and some snacks. And uh, after this, we need to hurry up. So who wants to first? It's me to choose. <laughs> so three quick questions. So have you tried LSTMs or one confidence? And it seems to me that that would allow you to do a genetic algorithm just to try some back proxy. Um, yes, yes, we did. Yes, we did. Uh, um, um, to be fair, we are uh, we are a bit new to the whole uh, neural networks um, game. Uh, uh, also, in the case of LSTM, uh, um, I'm not an expert of that. I can tell you, but um, it's typically uh, not easy to make a LSTM uh, uh, learn long-range patterns, and uh, this may be. In some cases, a bit, uh, a bit, uh, a bit trickier. Uh, in particular, if you have uh, year seasonality and you have quarter of hour granularity, you need a lot of points to really get. Um, but d definitely, something that we are we are exploring. We traditionally we are based on uh, on uh, on things like uh, random forest, extra trees, uh, ridge uh, boosting. Uh, but yeah, we are, we are open and we are, we are exploring also these, uh, these kind of uh, techniques.